Hello, everybody. Welcome to Confessing Concord, Transcendent Truth Media Network. Confessing the Book of Concord, the Lutheran Confessions. What are we confessing today? Well, we're confessing the return of Christ to judgment. And this is uh, what we would call in the church, theologically, eschatology. And eschatology is the study, the knowledge, uh, the words about last things. Last things regarding the end of time, as you will, however... Um, <clears throat> when we're dealing with especially the return of Christ to judgment and his reigning as king, and the eschatology known as amillennialism, which is the Lutheran eschatology, I want to make it very, very, very clear that one of the marks of our Lutheranism in this realm is a lot about the fulfillment of Christ's promises, the culmination and manifestation of the completion of our salvation, as well as the kingdom of God and its presence in the here and the now in this reality. All of that is to say, Lutheran eschatology is not so much fixed as a over there, future tense kind of thing that is promised but not yet happened, although that is a large portion of what we're talking about eschatologically. But we are also, as Lutherans, thinking, speaking, proclaiming, preaching about how these things relate to and actually come into the now, in the here and the now? How, how is it, for example, true that God's kingdom, contrary to the Kiliists, right, is not just over there, but right now, that God is reigning as king right now, that Jesus has his messianic kingdom in this world right now, right? That's, that's how Lutheranism brings eschatology, the not yet, into the already, if you will. Okay, so let's look at the article itself. Let's talk a little bit about the controversy, and uh, let's, you know, let's let's have fun. So it is also taught that our Lord Jesus Christ will return on the last day to judge, to raise all the dead, to give eternal life and eternal joy to those who believe and are elect, but to condemn the ungodly and the devils to hell and eternal punishment. So this is part of our apostolic creedal faith. I want to, I guess, bring this a little bit outside of the eschat eschatological debate for a second. And what we're confessing here is basically the capstone of the creed. Um, when we talk even about either the end of Article 2, that he will return to judge the living and the dead, also the end of Article 3 of the creed, um, I believe in the resurrection of the dead, the life of the world to come. That's what both of these things are about. That's how the creed ends in both of those articles. That's the reality that we look toward. Now, it's all culminating on what the, the, the word of God, as well as our confessions, called the last day. And in a sense, it is the last day, but it's the last day of this, um, I guess, page in eternity. Obviously, things don't end there because eternity begins there, if you will. Like, we af after the resurrection, what's the resurrection about? Eternal life. Well, obviously, beyond the last day, there is an eternal life. However, we also know from the book of Revelation that in this eternity, there will not be evening and morning. There will not be a nighttime, and so there will not be day. So you could do, you could do some kind of uh, intellectual gymnastics about this if you really wanted to, but it's, it's essentially just this kind of apocalyptic uh, regarding the theological genre of apocalypse uh, way of speaking, that there is coming a day in which all things change. That's the apocalyptic notion of the last day. And on this last day, what happens? The resurrection of the dead, all dead, not just, and here's the thing, not just those who are saved. Now, this uh, relates to something that historically Mennonites and Anabaptists believe in, but also you'll find some kind of weird niche, uh, sloppy evangelicals or ex-evangelicals or whatever they want to call themselves, who hold to something which has become popular among Instagram theologians. By the way, Instagram theologians should not be a thing, uh, but they are. Um, and it's called annihilationism. Annihilationism is the idea that, um, well, you, you have two forms of it. One, which is that the those who are not saved and redeemed will be resurrected and then abolished and consumed by the fire, or they will just not be resurrected and they're just lost, right? So, but the word of God proclaims to us and our, our book of Concord confesses and we confess in it that God on this last day will raise not just the saved, but all 
the dead. That's those who are in Christ, those who are outside of Christ, those who are forgiven, those who are condemned. All of them together will be resurrected and raised. And he will give eternal life and eternal joy to those who believe and are elect. So here we have this idea of election. And this, it's not really dealt with in the, the Augsburg Confession itself. It is dealt with in the formula of Concord. When we get there, we'll get there, okay? But we're not yet there. So here is where he gives eternal life. And this is a very interesting thing because we often think of eternal life as given in the here and now, and it is, right? For example, um, uh, we give eternal life in baptism. We give eternal life in the promise of... Uh, uh, the, 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 the word and the absolution. But the other thing is when the, when the word of God, when the Holy scriptures speak of eternal life, they speak of it as something not yet given. And even in these promises in the here and now, we speak of those who shall have eternal life, who will have eternal life. And that's because in this resurrection way, we actually don't have eternal life until we fully, if you will, have eternal life. So we have uh, the promise of eternal life, but we do not yet enjoy it because until you are no longer going to die, you don't have it, right? Um, although you ha you have it, but you don't yet have it. Does that kind of make sense? You have a promise to have it, but you have not yet received it in its fullness. And so we are still looking for the fullness of our uh reception of that promise, of that gift of eternal life, which will happen on the last day. And it will be given to all those who believe, all those who are elect, all those who are chosen uh, to be so. And you really hold hold your breath on that, on that notion of what does it mean to be elect? What does it mean to be chosen? Um, uh, don't import here Calvinist ideas. Some Lutherans will go that direction. Other Lutherans will go the way of intuitu fidei, an election in view of your faith. That is going to be handled elsewhere, but what I want you to do is ignore both of those assumptions. Rather, look in the formula of Concord. What do we see there about what it means to be elected? It says there, we confess, if one wants to know anything about election, their election, anyone other, anyone else's election, we should not be trying to delve into the unknown hidden things of God. That is, we should not be looking at this immutable will and decree of God, of this Calvinist kind of uh, idea, of this infralapsarian thing that's made its way into Missouri Lutheranism. That We don't want to be doing that. Even our formula of Concord says don't do that, Right. We also don't want to be going the way of the a full assumption that this means into a two for day. What do what does the book of Concord say to do? If you want to know anything about election, look to the cross. Look to the cross of his declaration that he wills all men to be saved and has worked unto his own death to save all men. Now, if you want to hold either of those positions, you can, but don't import them here on this. This all that's all that needs to be said. But rather, what is this about? Those who believed, those who are chosen in Christ from the beginning to be saved. And who who really, let, let me just say this on the matter. Who has God chosen to save? Who did he take up humanity to save? Who did he take the sins on uh, himself to save? Who did he die for? All people, right? This is uh, enough for us to know. But who is saved? Those who believe, right? But to condemn the ungodly and the devils to hell and to eternal punishment. Now, here we must note also with Christ's own words that on that last day, those who are unbelievers will go to the place prepared for the devil and his demons. Though it is not prepared for the unbeliever, it is prepared for the devil and his demons. And yet that's where they go. Because in this resurrection where God's kingdom encompasses all creation, there is nowhere to go outside of his reign, outside of his love, other than the realm of the devil and his demons. There is no other place that they can go to hide from God other than hell. And so they choose to go there instead of dwell with him. And how do we know this is the case? We know this is the case because his proclamation is that he has saved them and willed to have them. Their unbelief in that is a rejection. It's not because they cognitively can't grasp it. And he's saying, oh, well, because you can't just get over this hump, I'm not going to let you in, right? The reason people go to hell is not because God wants them to. The reason people go to hell is because they don't want to be where God is. So, then we get into, this is the basic faith of it, right? We have this idea of uh, the return of Christ in judgment. And, you know, we could really import here some other ideas of he will judge 
uh, based on works. This is in our Athanasian Creed. It's in the Holy Scriptures, and it's something to talk about. But because it's not native to the Augsburg Confessions article here, we're going to leave that until we discuss it elsewhere. So just keep in mind, um, again, when we're dealing with the Augsburg Confession, a lot of these things are in kernel form. They become fuller when we get into bigger confessions, the apology, the uh, formula, where we look at all of those matters in fuller, more concrete, more fleshed out ways. But here is just a simple statement of what we confess, what we believe. Christ is coming again. He's coming to judge. And judge means to essentially decide between, is it good? Is it evil? Is it saved? Is it not? Is it just? Is it unjust? Is it justified or unjustified, righteous or unrighteous? This is what he's coming to do. And we could say it's based on works because we know that from elsewhere. We could also say it's based on faith because we know that from elsewhere. The Augsburg Confession here does not have that native to the text of the confession. But all of that's going to be rattling around in our head, and it's part of our faith. It's part of our theology. But what is simply here is he is coming to judge. And so we must what then? Make ready in both ways. We must repent and we must believe. We must receive his promises because he is coming to raise all the dead and he's coming to give eternal life and eternal joy to those who believe and are elect. So what should we do? We should believe and make ready to make our calling and election sure as St. Paul the Apostle tells us to do. Because why? Because he will condemn the ungodly and the devils to hell and to eternal punishment. Now here again, how can we say, for example, that God doesn't want people to go to hell when it Obviously, we're confessing an active sense of the condemnation of the ungodly and the devils uh, to hell and eternal punishment. There is a sense in God's word where he speaks of this active condemnation. But what is the active condemnation based upon? The people's turning away from him, the people's plunging themselves into their own condemnation. This is why, for example, John 3 says, the Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world. Why? Because the world was already condemned. It had already condemned itself. What did he come to do? He came to save the world. If you turn away from that salvation, if you turn away from that forgiveness, what is left other than the condemnation you already have on yourself? Now, here also, we could speak of a legal uh, action sense, but we could speak likewise also of a kind of um, reprobation not in the Calvinist sense, but in the physical sense. So if I have, you know, what it means like reprobate silver, which is uh, from the scriptures, when you're refining metals and you find one that doesn't turn out on the conveyor belt line and it, you just throw it away, well, this is a reprobation of that. And this is also, you could say a condemnation. It's a casting off, a throwing away, a putting over there. Why? Because you can't use that in what you're doing. Um, and so this is the same idea. Um, the people who have made themselves to be the opposite of God's kingdom, really have no place in God's kingdom. And so they are condemned to the only other place they can go, which is hell. Rejected, therefore, now this is where we get into this kind of eschatological controversy. Rejected, therefore, are the Anabaptists who teach this Mennonites, by the way, not create, not like Baptist Baptists, but although Baptist Baptists do believe some strange things. But here's this very relevant thing of annihilationism. Anabaptists who teach that the devils and condemned human beings will not suffer eternal torment, or torture. Why? Because they believe in what's called annihilationism. And so the people are absolutely obliterated. And so they are not engaging or suffering eternal torment or torture. Now, this uh, is a question itself. Are we then confessing that those in hell do suffer torture? Torture at the hands of who? Of God? Is God torturing people? This is a big thing for us to kind of wrestle with. Um, the true answer is no. Uh, God does not cast people into hell to torture them. Rather, people refuse to be brought into heaven by his grace, and so they condemn themselves to hell. And in hell, they suffer what? the So would you, would you say the absence of God? No, God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. They are suffering the presence of God. They are suffering his love, which they do not want. And this is something that the early church fathers proclaimed to us in utter and sheer beauty, that even in hell, the light of God, the love of God are present, but it is present to those who will not receive it and to those who despise it and to those who do not want it. And so to them, it is suffering. To them, it is torture. To them, it is unpleasant, although it is the greatest beauty. 
Likewise, I rejected some Jewish teachings, which have also appeared in the present, that before the resurrection of the dead, saints and righteous people alone will possess a secular kingdom and will annihilate all the ungodly. Now, this is, some would say this is uh, premillennialism. Some would say this is postmillennialism. Look, it doesn't really matter. What it is, is to say the kingdom of God is not of this world. And in being a spiritual heavenly kingdom, it is one that does not manifest itself in the powers of this world. However, it obviously does manifest itself in institutions in this world. For example, the church. No one's going to say, oh, well, you can't have the church because this kingdom is not of this world. And the church is in this world. That's not what we're talking about. What we are talking about is the world is a place where uh, kingdoms and rulers rule and reign by the might and the power of the sword, by blood, by finance, by a corruption. The kingdom of God, rather, is one of peace, one of love, one of forgiveness, one of grace, one of suffering the cross right? And so his kingdom is not one that oppresses and subjugates the world, but one that that suffers at the hands of the world for the salvation of the world. And, so, and this is how we ought to understand this text. So that is to say, can you be a premillennial and a Lutheran? Well, some Lutherans are premillennial. You have entire synods that are historically premillennial, but they do not necessarily um, believe that they should confess this article. So you have to ask yourself kind of at some point in what kind of way are Lutherans bound to be all millennials? Obviously, if you have a kind of premillennialism that is teaching that there will be for a thousand years uh, an earthly kingdom of Jesus on this, on this earth and there will be no heathen kingdoms, you might still be able to kind of do enough theological intellectual gymnastics to get around this article insofar as you might be able to say, for example, <laughs> we do not believe in bringing God's kingdom through the might of the sword, but Christ has come and established his kingdom in the way that Christ does, which is not by power, not by glory. So you could say there could be a, a um, an altered, modified Lutheran premillennialism, but my question to those who are trying to do that is why would you want to do that? Biblically speaking, I do not find premillennialism whatsoever enticing, whatsoever convincing. Um, and so I would, I would, I guess, encourage everybody to go back to that um, ancient, historic, still continuing understanding of the church that we have eschatologically. And it's not necessarily all millennialism because the church historically doesn't think eschatologically in the term of that singular verse about the millennium. But we think in regard to God's kingdom now working itself out in the church, coming through prayer, through grace, through love, through forgiveness. That's what it's all about. So anyways, I hope that's a little bit helpful. I know that because we're still in the Augsburg Confession, we still have things in, in, in some articles that are very much brief, very much concise, and lack a lot of the kind of the, the, the fleshed outness that we might desire, but it's not worth fleshing them out here ourselves because we're going to come to fuller expressions of them throughout the Book of Concord. So anyways, just hold, hold those thoughts you have. We will get there. It might take us a thousand years, but we will get there. Um, God's grace to you, God's love to you. And remember, as you, I guess, go out from this kind of reflection on Christ's return, um, that he is returning. And that's a hope for us, but it's also uh, a, a warning or a wake-up call to us that we need to daily repent, daily turn from our sin and from our self-righteousness toward his saving grace, mercy, and love through the forgiveness of sins, which is accomplished in his cross and comes to us in word and sacrament, wherever we find it. All right, God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Take care.